Hello again, this is Trevor Backoffner, Students and Families Pastor at First Christian Church, and I'm glad you're here as we are on week three of our series through Second Peter. Peter wrote to Gentile Christians in Asia Minor for three reasons, three overarching reasons. The first, to encourage them to follow God well, just to have a proper understanding of the power that God has, how awesome he is, and how that motivates us to action. That's what we talked about in week one. Last week, we looked at kind of some of the beginning warnings to, uh, you know, stay away from false teachers and and really just the um, sort of the credentials of scripture, as well as the apostles' testimony and how we can trust those things. This week, we're getting into a little bit deeper of a topic. Um, in that uh, second reason, the warning against false teachers, and then week three, next week, we'll get into the third reason, which is the proper view of the end times, eschatology, as the word is. And Peter is really using some difficult language here in chapter two. So we're just going to read through this and um, kind of unpack it a little bit throughout. And it's quite a bit longer of a section, so I won't have any Um, sections on the screen today of verses, but we'll talk about it throughout and you can follow along in your Bible. So starting with verse one, I'll be in the CSB version if you'd like to follow along word for word. Peter begins, there were indeed false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them and will bring swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved ways, and the way of truth will be maligned because of them. They will exploit you in their greed with made-up stories. Their condemnation, pronounced long ago, is not idle, and their destruction does not sleep. So, to begin with, the false teachers that he's speaking of are really viewing their audience as a means to an end. Peter's still kind of continuing with his credentials here, because in verses 16 through 21, he highlights that hey, I'm not this person that's trying to get you to believe this just so I look good. That's what the false teachers are doing. The false teachers were viewing people as objects of pawns to be moved in order to get themselves greater prestige and to lead people in the way that they wanted them to go. But Peter's saying that that's not who he is and that's not what the Word of God's about. So he continues in in explaining this is that these people are depraved. They are doing things that aren't in line with what God has asked of us. And because of that, they're distorting the truth. The truth is being taken out of context. It's being changed. So he's saying that they're going to deal with that repercussion at a later point. He says their condemnation is not idle. It was pronounced a long time ago. Their kind of death sentence was was written. So... He continues in verse 4. He says, For if God didn't spare the angels who sinned but cast them into hell and delivered them in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment, and if he didn't spare the ancient world but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, when he brought the flood on the world of the ungodly, and if he reduced the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes and condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is coming to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the depraved behavior of the immoral, For as that righteous man lived among them day by day, his righteous soul was tormented by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who follow the polluting desires of the flesh and despise authority. So he uses a few examples here. The first of those are angels that sinned. Uh, What he's probably referring to is in Genesis chapter 6, where it talks about the sons of sons of man or sons of God, depending on the translation, but came down and they um, mated with human women. And out of those relationships were born the Nephilim, so people like Goliath, this race of giant people. Um, In doing so, they sinned. They kind of crossed some species barriers and did something that was outside of what God had asked of them. And so he delivered them to utter darkness, the chains in utter darkness. He refers to it as Tartarus here, um, which in Greek mythology is like the lowest form of hell where the worst people go. Um, So he's kind of 
alluding to some of the Gentile um, beliefs from their former life to really give them a picture of that understanding. He uses Noah, um, saying that he spared Noah from the flood in Genesis chapter 7, you know, um, talking about how he just created this giant flood that kind of wiped everybody out except for Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives. Um, He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, which was an incredibly wicked city that was um, engaging in some really terrible behavior and wouldn't repent of those behaviors. And God destroyed it, even though Lot lived there. And Lot was saved from that um, because he was righteous and didn't engage in those things. So it's because God knows how to rescue the godly and also judge the ungodly, we can we can kind of trust that that's going to happen. He continues here, um, first, um, at the end of verse 10, going into 11, he says, Bold, arrogant people, they are not afraid to slander the glorious ones. However, angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a slanderous charge against them before the Lord. But these people, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, slander what they do not understand, and in their destruction they too will be destroyed. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. They consider it a pleasure to carouse in broad daylight. They are spots and blemishes, delighting in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery that never stop looking for sin. They seduce unstable people and have hearts trained in greed. Children under a curse. They have gone astray by abandoning the straight path and have followed the path of Balaam, the son of Bazor, who loved the wages of wickedness but received a rebuke for his lawlessness. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. So initially, he, he's really speaking into the sinful nature of these people. Says they always are looking for opportunities to engage in more, um, what we, he's describing as depraved behavior, debauchery, like deception. And they're not just satisfied with doing those acts themselves. They want the people around them to also engage in those things too. And he's saying they are, they are accursed because of this. In verse 17, he says, These people are springs without water, mists driven by a storm. The gloom of darkness has been reserved for them. For by uttering boastful, empty words, they seduce with fleshly desires and debauchery people who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption, since people are enslaved to whatever defeats them. For if, having escaped the world's impurity through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in these things and defeated, the last state is worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy command delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a washed sow returns to wallowing in the mud. That's the end of the chapter. And it's really a a difficult chapter to read. He ends here by highlighting how these people really just are lying to those who have found the truth. They're, They're so caught up in the slavery to their sin and to the corrupt lifestyle that they're living that they want to make people also feel as bad as they are. They want people to also be engaging in the things that they are. And they're succeeding. There are people here that he's talking about who knew what the truth of the gospel was, but they chose to walk away from it because there were empty promises. There were promises of more freedom. You get to do what you want. You can be whoever you want to be. But God didn't create us to be whatever we wanted. God didn't create us to do whatever we wanted. He created us for specific purposes. And when we do whatever we want, it's when we get into trouble. When we do whatever we want, it's when we are engaged in corruption. When we do whatever we want, most times it will lead us to sin. That's who we are because of our brokenness. Adam and Eve made that choice and because of that choice that they made we also have that nature within us and i know that this is a lot i know that it's never it's never a good conversation when we have to 
talk about God's judgment. It's not comfortable. We don't like talking about God's judgment. We want to talk about the, the nice parts of Jesus, of the Jesus who loves me and accepts me for who I am, who died on the cross for me. But we don't want to talk about the judgment. We don't want to talk about the punishment of a lack of repentance. Repentance being a turning away from the sinful lifestyle. And I'm not here to, to talk to you this week and to scare you. That's not my goal here. Um, I'm not trying to push you into any specific decision. I just want you to know that God's judgment is real. Um, in order for life to happen as God intended it, there needs to be a balance in everything. And... In order for divine blessing to take place, there also has to be divine punishment. There's a minimum standard that has to be met. And when Jesus came to earth and he lived a godly life, he was perfect without sin, and he died on the cross for us, and took that sin for us. Then he went to the grave, he died, and he rose again, and then he ascended to be at the right hand of the Father. All of that is under one thing it's that we accept what he did it's us saying yes i believe jesus is who he says he is i believe what he did is sufficient to take my sin and to wipe the slate clean of my record from now till the end of my life it's me saying yes it's me following god that's the minimum standard to be set and and Here's the thing. Everyone will have to make a decision whether or not they want to follow God. And some people in here chose to follow God and then they walked away. Some people just chose not to follow God and they wanted to believe things about life and things about people that aren't true. And there are also people that want to make that decision to follow God. And if you haven't made that decision yet, I'd love to have a conversation with you about what that might look like to answer any questions you might have um, and to see about any sort of next steps. But that's the nature of the gospel is that Jesus so wants us to say yes, that he came and he died so that we could. He loved us so much um, that he wanted to bless us with eternity. And we receive that, um, or we don't. And that's a hard truth. Um, but I trust in God because he is God, and I'm not. And I want you to, to remember that God does love you. That's why he did this. He does accept you. That's also why he did this. But he also does not want you to stay where you are. He wants you to be like him. He wants you to hold firm to your faith when the people around you are really trying to push you in different directions. Like for these false teachers, they really wanted others to be experiencing the same, same things that they were experiencing. They were pushing them to believe that if they lived the life that they wanted, they would have more freedom. In reality for us, when we live outside of God's intended design for people, we're actually experiencing less freedom than following God and adhering to how he lives. And that's what Peter's trying to get out here. He's trying to warn them against what these teachers are, are trying to communicate and to stand firm in their faith with God. Let's pray. God, we love you and we praise you and we know that there are parts of who you are that sometimes scare us um, that the judgment piece is not one that we want to experience but god i thank you that you have given us a way out of that judgment that there is a better life with more freedom with more purpose and more meaning when we accept and follow jesus for any students that have not yet made that decision, um, I just want to pray 
that you would present someone in their life, whether it be me or someone else, um, that would be able to talk to them and help them process through that. We love you so much, God. We thank you for this word from Second Peter chapter 2. And we say all these things in your name.